Professor Jan Charles Rochet from University of Zurich. You are uh, a, an expert. You have been following the banking regulation on that. Uh, you're an authority on that. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank here. you. Um, you're based in Zurich. You're based in Europe. So you you're in ground zero right now. Exactly. Um, uh, both crises, the United States crisis and Europe crisis, were born from the banking sector. That's right. Um, was what, those are the same characteristics, the United States crisis in 2008 and current crisis in Europe from the banking crisis. It's the same kind of, uh, of uh, crisis, same kind of characteristic from the banks? I do believe that what we're having in Europe is more severe because it also involves the lack of coordination with the, with between governments within the European Union. So it's something that the, the U.S. don't have. But I, I would like to focus more on uh, the international banking crisis that started in 2007, uh, because I believe that the crisis that we're having in Europe at the moment is as a strong political content. So I'm, I would like to concentrate mm -hmm. more on the banking crisis that started in the U.S. but propagated to Europe. And I do believe that a large element of this crisis was due to a wrong perception of the role of regulators in this. Um, uh, the uh, origin... Which is, which is the same as lack of regulations? No, no I wouldn't say that. I would say uh, a, a, a wrong conception of... Because it started uh, the, in the, uh, uh, at the end of the 1980s by the, the, um, um, the remark that uh, there were very different uh, uh, treatment of uh, banks in different countries. And in particular, the US and uh, uh, English banks were concerned that in Japan, for example, banks were able to lend massively uh, without having a lot of capital. And uh, they imposed the uh, uh, international standards for capital ratios that would give a minimum capital uh, 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 ratio uh, to banks and limit the capacity to lend um, to, so as to have an um, even playing field in different countries. And so that, that was a good thing. That was a good thing, but the irony was that the Basel Committee, who uh, started to uh, propose those uh, regulations, was uh, manipulated by the large banks uh, because it didn't, didn't have the competence to understand uh, the modern activities of bank, which are very complex. And so the, the Basel Committee was sort of forced to uh, let the big banks uh, explain how they should be regulated, which is a paradoxical situation because you would like the regulator to impose mm. its views on banks. And as a result, the, the banks could completely empty uh, the regulator, the, re the regulation from its content. And um, I think that we are running exactly on the same mistakes. That is, the Basel Committee has been heavily criticized for having forgotten completely about liquidity. Uh, the, the Basel Committee has focused on solvency and um, the um, liquidity was completely absent. And now, with Basel III, the, the new set of regulations, they are trying to impose very complex regulations for liquidity. And the banks are explaining, you know, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about. Liquidity is a very complex decision. And you are not going to find a regulation that, uh, um, that is valid for all circumstances. So I believe the same scenario is going to, um, is to, to, to happen in the sense that the banks will be able to um, avoid uh, uh, the, uh, the um, to, to empty the regulation from its contents. So I believe we should go back to simplicity. I believe there is a simple uh, fundamental principle in banking regulation, which is if it's complex, don't do it. Because if it's complex, mm -hmm. banks will manage to avoid it and to game it. Um, would that be the explanation of the reason why the Latin American banking uh, banking system uh, um, withstood the crisis so well? Because it's so uh, basic. So, I, 
to some extent, yes. And I think I find it very ir ironic that for so many years, uh, the Americans, the North Americans, and the Europeans have been telling developing countries, this is how you should manage to avoid those uh, stupid banking crises that you have now. And now it's the reverse. Now you, you see some countries like Brazil, for example, Argentina, explaining to the uh, US or to Europe, oh, we have some experience on the management of banking crisis yeah. and we can tell you what you should do. So I, I, I really think that experience, uh, the, the Latin American countries in particular, uh, have, have drawn a lot of, uh, of knowledge from the management of the different crises they have been exposed to. And I do believe that there is something to learn uh, I was particularly impressed yesterday after the, the speech of the, the, your Minister of Finance to see how this country has been able to solve the debt problem, to, to uh, you know, invest on, on the young generations. And if you see, if you look at the situation in Europe at the moment, especially in Spain, in Italy, in, in France, that's a less, uh, there is a lesson we can learn from that. But it's, it's different from the topic of today. Now, now tell me something. Uh, according to what you just said on your, in your first response, so you're saying that in five years, the banking systems, both in Europe and the United States, is going to look exactly the same as it looked five years ago. It will be probably a bit different, but the same type of problems will occur. That is, we will have a new form of you know, risk uh, taking place. And uh, the, the supervisors will not uh, avoid that. And is that because of uh, lack of political will, lack of political power? I do believe that, I mean, and, and this is, I'm serious on that, I do believe that the, the growth of the, and the concentration of the financial sector in countries like the US, the UK, and to a, a lesser extent, uh, continental Europe, is a concern for democracy. I really believe that the power the lobbying power of the big banks has, done, has, has gone too far. It's true that the industry should be consulted when there is a project for a reform, for a regulation. But, I mean, the interest of the general population has to be taken into account. And I believe there was a window of opportunity at some point when the crisis erupted in Europe, in the US. The people in the street were fed up with the injection of capital, support for the banks, and there really was a moment where you could have reformed the system in depth. And unfortunately, this is not what has happened. And so I believe we have, we have lost an opportunity to reform the system in depth. Now, what about this uh, proposal, this uh, movement in Europe uh, towards the uh, Central Bank of Europe taking uh, broad power over the whole uh, banking system of the continent? What about that? Is that a good thing? Of course. I mean, from the start, I always advocated for such a system. It doesn't make sense to have a Euro European Union, monetary union, as a unique monetary policy, but different domestic supervisions. In different countries, mm. the regulations have been implemented in very different ways. So what's the purpose of having an harmonized regulation if it, in the implementation there are huge differences between countries? So I believe that was badly needed. And some people criticize the central banks as a, I mean, giving, have the, have the fear that giving too much power to the central bank and having a supranational supervisor is a threat to democracy. And I believe it's exactly the opposite. I believe that those people don't understand the fundamental problem of demo democracy, which is the lack of commitment of government. You cannot commit on what the future government will do. That's democracy. And to avoid that, and the symptoms are clear from the point of view of public debt, for example. The reason why countries have borrowed so much is because they cannot commit on what the, 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 the so they, they, they have a short term views and you need some constitutional limits to public debt and this the, the equivalent in the domain of banking would be to give strong uh, power to an independent supervisor which has to be European. And do you think that's going to fly? I, I'm, I'm quite uh, optimistic on that particular aspect, even though there will be, but it, it all depends on the management of the debt crisis. If we manage to go out of this big mess, then I'm optimistic. 
And you see, there was a big chance for Europe of having a, a young generation of people being European and not you know, French, German, English, etc. And this has been spoiled by the European politicians because they have put their interest, their domestic interests first. So I, I'm optimistic that if we manage to go, go, get out from the sovereign crisis, there may be uh, sufficient pressure for the young generation to uh, you know, look at the interest of Europe as a whole. You keep telling, you keep telling, uh, you keep saying if, if, you don't think you will? I don't know. I, I'm really, I'm really concerned. You're still I'm concerned? Really, yeah. You, 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 I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, uh, we, we extensively talk about this, but we're here in America. We watch it on TV via satellite dish, and uh, not, it's not very usual that we have people from Europe, especially you from Switzerland, so you also are in ground zero, but also not affected that much. So uh, do you still think that that can really implode? Yes, because look at the situation of Spain, for example, where 50% of the young generation is unemployed. How can you sustain that in the long run? So you're thinking in social things? Yes. I mean, social uh, It's more unrest. social. Yeah, the financial problems are subsidiary. The, 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 you can always find a solution to financial problems. But if the majority of the young generation uh, feels completely uh, rejected by the system, then we might have a big political crisis. And this is what I fear the most. Um, what's... Can you tell us what do you see in two years in, in your continent? What's going to be, how it's going to be? So I see two scenarios. One, the optimistic scenario where we manage to get out of this crisis problems. And as I said, the young generation, you know, tries to put pressure on politicians to really uh, coordinate for the interest of Europe as a whole. That's the good scenario. I would, you know, maybe 25, 30 percent probability of that that's happening. Wow. The, with the second scenario, is much more dramatic, and I uh, I can see that in countries like Greece, Portugal, Spain, uh, a large fraction of the population is, is completely fed up because they have put so many the international organizations I, I, like IMF or the European uh, Commission or Germany have put so much pressure on, on poor people. And they see that uh, some people have made a lot of money during the crisis, uh, before the crisis, like in Spain, for example, the people working in the real estate or, uh, those people have made a lot of money and uh, they are not uh, really uh, asked to contribute to the, to, to, to the, to, to the um, concessions in order to get out of the crisis. So I believe there is a, the question is, Will this be sufficient to provoke a big political uh, you know, crisis? I hope not, but I'm not sure. But uh, you, you give that scenario some 70, 75 percent. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, it's a c <laughs> certainly uh, uh, something that may happen. Jan Charles Rochette from uh, University of Zurich. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.